Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Urban Experience Committee. I'll turn it over to council member and chair of the committee, Karen Stratton. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome and happy Monday. This is the Urban Experience Committee meeting for Monday, May 10th. And to get started, we want to do the approval of the minutes. And I had one question on that for Danielle. Danielle, are you on? Yes. On the minutes, the only question I had on those before we move to approve is under agenda items number one, under shared mobility. This was the April um, minutes, but it says the item was removed and will be presented in March. I just wanted to bring that. That was confusing to me. Um, I think it was meant to be May. Okay. I'm trying to remember from that. So I'll get that removed before um, it's finalized. Okay, perfect. That was my only thing that I noticed. Does anybody have comments on the minutes? Can I get a motion for approval? I move to approve with a change of the month from March to May, as noted. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opponents? Okay, so the minutes from April 12th, 2021 have been approved. Next, uh, we're going to go down to- Council Member Stratton? Yes. I, I, I might have misheard, but I think the only motion was to amend the minutes and they actually, the motion wasn't to approve them, I don't think. No, it was to approve with, oh, the with change. that change. Okay, got it. Thank you. I withdraw. Are we okay there? Yep, yep, we are. Okay, great. So we'll head down the agenda under discussion items and staff requests. We are very, very lucky this afternoon to have Dr. Patrick Jones with us. Um, and he is going to give about a 20 minute presentation. Dr. Jones, do you think you can do it in 20 minutes? We're gonna give it our best shot to uh, council member Stratton. Okay, so I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Patrick Jones. Most of us are very familiar with Dr. Jones and his work, and um, we truly are grateful that you're able to join us this afternoon. Um, sure. and he is going to do a quarter one economic indicators presentation for us. Take it away. Right. Yeah, thank you. A uh, maiden voyage with this uh, this new product that uh, we've been asked to do for the city, and, and uh, helping me out is my friend and associate, Dr. Kelly Cullen, uh, who will go over part of it with me. But I need to uh, share my screen with somebody. How can we get that done? So Hannah Lee can help with that, I believe. All right, Hannah Lee, could you get me to share my screen? She is working on it. I see her. Right with okay. Let's see. Oh, if you hit. Oh, there you go. Am I there? Um, Can you see this screen that says City Council Meetings? Yes. Yes. Okay. I'm sharing my screen. Okay. Well, let's get started. Um, so, uh, many of you have been a part of the uh, meetings that would take place every few months uh, with the mayor. Uh, at the time, uh, leading those meetings on, on looking at the Spok city of Spokane economy. We haven't had those uh, recently, but this is really, an, uh, I think, an effort to try to do much the same, uh, at least from a reporting out perspective. And um, you'll see just what we've included in here. The, the list that we have uh, agreed upon is uh, something I've worked out with uh, Tonya Wallace, and I hope it's a value to you. So what we're trying to do is to give you insights uh, uh, at a little more frequency than annual data. Uh, and so we have to be kind of creative on what we find for the city and in some cases the county that offers these insights. And so you can see that uh, we have looked at migration, employment, construction, two different ways, and then taxable retail sales. And we're uh, trying to denominate all these uh, all this data, these indicators, uh, at the level of the city of Spokane, where 
where it's possible. And, and uh, unless we say otherwise, we are at the city level. Now, I'm going to start uh, with one of these indicators, and this is not at the city level, but uh, it's, a, it's an important measure of how we're growing population-wise and kind of gives us a heads up about what the results might be once we get the numbers from OFM or census, as the case is uh, in this year. And so this is looking at those people who move in from out of state and uh, by law surrender their license plates or surrender their driver's license to uh, the state of Washington and, and receive a new one. And uh, this is looking at quarterly data and most of most of what we're going to be looking at are quarterly numbers. There's a few, there are a couple that are monthly, which you'll see here shortly. And um, so I just want to point out, we start here in the first quarter of 2019, and we end uh, all the way through the last quarter of 2020. And um, you can see here, this orange line is capturing uh, the growth rate and the purple lines are capturing the actual uh, relinquishments. And um, I, I don't need to explain what happened here in the second quarter of 2020, but uh, it, it basically fell off to almost zero. And then it rebounded very nicely uh, in the third and fourth quarters of uh, 2020. Um, I will point out, that for, uh, unless we see a, a real big change here, uh, from our presumed estimates that the growth rate uh, of driver's license surrenders, that is those who come in from out of state, had been declining. Uh, these are negative growth rates. Uh, and then it became very negative until it rebounded uh, in the third quarter. So if we're getting growth from um, uh, people moving into the county, it could very well be that the growth is coming from other parts of the state and not necessarily what we might think from, say, California. So, Kelly, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you take it uh, over the next few slides and tell the uh, people on the meeting just what you found out about the labor market. Question? No? Please. Awesome. Thank you. Go ahead, Kelly. Go ahead. Can you um, continue to run the slideshow? I think that would be uh, yes, more. Yes, I will. I will. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. Well, thank you guys for having us here today. Uh, my part of the presentation was uh, in part to look at the labor force and unemployment and number of jobs slides here. So I've got a couple slides to tell us about how healthy uh, Spokane, the city of Spokane labor force is right now. Um, as you can see on this chart, this is just the labor force. And this is from our local area unemployment statistics. Um, and what I'm doing here is I'm going to do the big picture, and then uh, in some later slides, Patrick will be diving, drilling down a little bit more into different sectors. Uh, so this is just the overall labor force, civilian labor force here. Um, and so in this case, the purple bars that represent the size of the labor force. To be in the labor force, you must uh, have a job or be actively looking for a job. Uh, so it's comprised of those people. So people who are like stay-at-home parents, um, or choosing not to work students and things like that. Retirees are not necessarily in the labor force unless they are actively looking for work or they're holding a job. Uh, so in this case, that's what that first number says. It's made up of the size of the labor force includes both those who currently have a job as well as those who have been actively looking in the last four weeks who are unable to find one. So that's the unemployed portion. The purple bars, you can see there's um, a little dip, obviously, in that uh, second quarter of 20. Um, the purple bar shows the absolute size, and then the red line shows the change from the previous quarter or from the previous year, same quarter. So Q3 2020 uh, compared to Q3 2019, right? Um, obviously, we saw the effect of the pandemic and the stay at home directives in that second quarter of 20. Um, the CLF fell and then it went to uh, 2019. And that red line makes the change, the year to year change, look really significant. Do keep in mind the scale is on the right hand uh, vertical axis. And so the scale of that is down 2%, um, which is not that dramatic, but yet significant. Was there a question? No? Okay. So that's uh, what happened there. Most of uh, 
2019 and first two quarters of 2020 saw some increase. Oh, the red line, you can see it was flat for a period of time in the 35 to 4%. So we had been growing our CLF at that rate until the effect of the pandemic. Um, I went and looked at the uh, numbers for uh, the first quarter of this year, 2021, sneak peek, obviously, and these are preliminary numbers. Uh, we'll have them for you in the next quarter update, obviously. Um, but we are up in terms of the purple bar for first quarter of 21. Uh, we're up over 105,000. So we're back. We're still up over that 100,000 threshold. Um, and looking good uh, in the first quarter of 2021. So we don't anticipate that that red line uh, will go down again. <laughs> this is number that, so whereas the um, CLF was like the demand side, uh, who wants a job? This is the supply side in terms of the number of jobs that are available. And this is total employment. Obviously, again, that red line looks really dramatic because that's the year-to-year -year change. Uh, the purple bar is the absolute level, the total number of jobs. Uh, and so you can see that it did fall off really dramatically, uh, minus 5.5% there at the trough. Um, and then what was I oh, Q3, you see the dip in purple bars down under the 100,000, but then the rebounding in the last, the end of 2020. Uh, I looked ahead just to give you a sneak peek. Uh, for the first quarter of 2021, again, preliminary, uh, still being in the stages of revision, but uh, around 98,000. So a little below the 100,000, but still, um, you know, doing pretty healthy, I think, in this case, in terms of our number of jobs and total employment. Unemployment. Look at that. <laughs> Isn't that scary looking? Uh, so unemployment, obviously, you see the huge peak. Uh, that happened uh, right in March and April of 2020 with the effects of the stay at home orders um, and the effect of COVID. And then you can see the economy rebounding um, and you can see the unemployment rates falling off pretty quickly. Um, so we want lower unemployment numbers, obviously. Since April 2020, unemployment rate has fallen significantly. And in December of 2020, it was actually only 2% higher than it was December of 2019. So that's good, right? So our economy has come back mostly, still dealing with a little bit of extra unemployment though. Um, and then January 21, the monthly rate, I looked it up, it's only one percentage point higher uh, than it was a year previously in January 2020 before the bottom fell out, right? Um, so things are going to I did sneak peek unemployment. Uh, what was my unemployment numbers? Oh, and also comparing our unemployment rate uh, to the state uh, for right now, this is right now preliminary numbers again, uh, the state is at 5.4. As of March, end of March, we were at 6.6. .6. And then the national level, just to ballpark us uh, compared to the national average, big picture, real big picture, they're at 6.0. So we're slightly higher than both the state uh, and the nation. Um, but considering what we've been through, I don't think that's bad. <laughs> And I'll just point out, uh, thank you, Kelly. Historically, the city of Spokane, the county of Spokane, have, has had uh, unemployment rates that are much higher, considerably higher than uh, the U.S. and uh, the state. So uh, for those of you who have been a question, anybody? We're trying yeah, to get to the question. question. Go ahead. So for the, for the unemployment numbers, do, do we know um, – what percentage uh, there may be that are unemployed that are simply have given up, you know, because their their industry is hit in such a way that they, they just simply aren't looking for alternative work. Go ahead, Kelly. I no, at this point, that unemployment number does not capture uh, discouraged workers. Uh, okay. So people who have stopped looking are not included uh, in the unemployment uh, survey if they answer that they have not looked in the last four weeks. So, so that's we, yeah. There's national estimates out there, and, and uh, I don't think we have any for Spokane, but uh, it's 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 not a trivial number in many cases, as you probably know. Okay, so this is uh, this is actually something for those of you who've been at the mayor's council meetings in the past that Doug Tweedy would do, and and uh, we were hoping that uh, we could get uh, a similar sort of numbers for the city of Spokane. Uh, from Doug uh, for this presentation, but he's been swamped. And uh, so we went ahead and just did it for the county. But as you may recall, 
these are the we're going to look at five sectors that really matter for the economy of the city of Spokane. And uh, in this case, I said we're going to have to use use county numbers, but in in many cases, most of the county data really are reflected or are represented by city numbers. So we're going to take it small to large. And uh, this is the largest sector in our county economy and in our city economy, which is healthcare and social assistance. And uh, I'll just point out that you can see uh, over time uh, in 2019, uh, we gained considerably and, and the growth rate, as Kelly was pointing out, quarter to the similar quarter from a year ago is that's, that's a fairly robust number. And even in the throes of the pandemic, healthcare was increasing. That is a positive, little bit of a positive number there. And uh, the latest data we have only go through Q3 of 2020. Unfortunately, we wish we had 20, uh, fourth quarter of 2020, but you can see it's rebounded there as well. Uh, just to give you a sense of perspective, uh, about 43,000 people work in this sector we are over proportionally represented in, by any comparison to uh, cities like us, communities like us, the state, the U.S. And uh, the average annual wage, just to throw something in here, why, why this might be important to consider, is about 52,000. Um, the average annual wage overall in the county is about 50,000. Uh, there's a big difference between the pay from hospitals and ambulatory care uh, offices of health care and what we call social assistance. But uh, uh, this has been a anchor to our economy uh, over the last few months. This has not been an anchor to our economy. This is the second largest sector, and I'm, I've uh, purposely kept the scale on the left-hand side the same. So uh, you can see there's a, quite of a drop off between healthcare and retailing, the second largest sector. And um, it was actually declining. Uh, that's, these are declines in here before uh, the pandemic hit. Once the pandemic hit and the closures that went with it, uh, the unemployment, or not the unemployment, but the employment in that sector went down considerably and it didn't rebound in the third quarter to be positive. So uh, overall uh, average employment, about 26,000 in the community, uh, that is the county, and a much different wage of $34,000 per year for the average retail worker. Third largest and most dramatically hit sector of the county economy and the city economy is what we call hospitality. And this includes all lodging as well as all forms of eating out, uh, drinking out. Uh, and I want to point out, uh, uh, again, I've, normally we wouldn't have this line isolated up here, but because I've tried to keep the sense of proportion the same between the subsequent uh, slides, uh, it, it's by itself here, but this line represents very solid growth over the 2019 period before we hit pandemic. And once we hit the pandemic, you can see the employment in the hospitality sector just took a horrific plunge with one third of, of, a, of a decrease in quarter two over 2019's quarter. Um, average employment here is uh, 18,500 plus or minus in the county. And on the other hand, uh, the the uh, the average annual wage here is about the lowest we have in the economy, and I think that's due in part to the part-time nature of work in this sector. But it's also it just reinforces that between this sector and retail, the sectors that have been the hardest hit, the pay is the lowest and the incomes are the lowest. Patrick? Okay, now let's let's Patrick? turn to a sector that we've we've tracked forever. Patrick? Yes, go uh, ahead. Councilmember Council Mum has a question. Councilmember Mum, good to see you. Good to see you too. How do those two sectors stack up nationally on the rebound? Are we about experiencing the same as either state or, or national on that rebound on the hospitality and 
you know, I knew you'd ask me a hard question that we don't have the data for. <laughs> Uh, I, I don't know, but my my sense is that the, uh, we are doing about as good as uh, as well as uh, the state. I don't know about the nation. Uh, we might be doing a little bit better than the state in the rebound, to be honest with you. But we can find that out. I'll get back to you on that. Um, I just would like to know, we've pushed real hard to support local. Yes, yes. Um, and uh, I... You know, I, we do work in other communities, and I'll tell you that they're doing much the same. Uh, this has been a concerted effort by by your counterparts throughout the state is to support these two sectors, and uh, it's it's a pretty tough go. So uh, let's go on to something then that uh, we've tracked as a growth industry for Spokane. As you can see here, uh, the, the scale is the same. Uh, and so the, the, the growth rate line is above the, the bars. But it's still a very positive, uh, very positive growth rate we've seen here. And I think many of you know what professional and technical services are, but there's a definition there in that first bullet. And you can see this is a very fast growing part of our economy. And I will say this, it's largely a downtown uh, sector. So lawyers, accountants, architects, engineers, consultants, these are largely a very urban uh, occupation or urban occupations. Uh, that's a minus 3.2 percent, by the way. I didn't, I didn't uh, move that over enough for you to see the minus. So it did take a hit in quarter two, uh, uh, and hasn't really come back all the way. That's still a negative growth rate in quarter three, uh, but it's relatively small compared to retailing and the hospitality business. The fourth, it's the fourth largest sector at 10,500, and the average annual wage you can see here is much larger, much higher than the uh, overall. Uh, Average annual wage of 50,000. So this is something we like to see grow. And then the final one is finance and insurance in terms of size. This is also largely a urban sector. Uh, there are certainly parts in uh, other parts of the county, but this is largely in your uh, backyard. And uh, it may surprise you to know that in contrast to the professional and technical services, that there is very little growth uh, before the pandemic. Uh, and we've seen this with branch closers and banking. Uh, I expected to see some of that made up by insurance, which we have a lot of insurance workers in our community, in particular the city, but not so much. But here's the, here's the kicker. Uh, in, in, uh, in the first quarter and second quarter, growth rate and third quarter for that matter, growth rate was actually quite positive. Uh, so it's a bit of a puzzle to me. Uh, perhaps uh, if we had some bankers in the line, we could we could figure out what's going on. But one of the, one of the thoughts might be they've had to make sure to uh, have enough people uh, hands on deck to go through all the federal uh, PPP loans and the like. Uh, so rounding out then this top five uh, set of sectors for the city of Spokane is about 10,000 throughout the county. Again, most in the city and a very, very nice uh, average annual wage of about $85,000. So again, jobs we like to see in our community. Now we're gonna move into something that uh, Tonya really thought it would be important for you to see, which is construction and permitting data. So I'll let Kelly take it over the next few slides. Hey, Patrick, can I ask a quick question? You bet. Uh, with regard to the professional side, do you, do you have any thoughts as to why that took such a hit and why it's, it's not rebounding quite yet? I I, just, I wonder because so many of those jobs were able to mitigate uh, for some of the COVID impacts uh, by working from home or, or doing right. other things. And so I'm, I'm just kind of curious why, why you think that is. You know, as I look at each of those components, uh, I, I don't know uh, why they would have gone down. I think accountants probably kept their the only thing I can think is that, that some of these, uh, and I'm speaking as a dad of a recently minted uh, graduate who falls into one of these categories, is that the hiring slowed down. So you may have had departures, but not, not the reloading of, 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 the, of the young end, the front end of some of these firms. And I think that will change though as, as people uh, become a little more confident in the economy and they need to staff up, uh, be it, you know, if you're an engineer, if you're an accountant, not an accountant, but uh, an architect uh, as construction gears up, which could, could, I think will. Uh, but beyond that, 
I really don't have any good ideas. Uh, it was a bit of a surprise. To, to yeah, I, I just wonder if maybe it's an up or downstream issue and, and the clients that they would have served or are not able to do their their side of the business and then, you know, on and on that domino goes. So well, that was the only thing I thought, but I just wondered if you had more data on that. Yeah, Councilor yeah. Catherine, that's a good idea because the construction business, which is not part of the top, top five here, uh, definitely went down and to the degree that engineers and architects service that business, uh, yeah, that would make a lot of sense. Okay, uh, Kelly, take it away. You're muted, Kelly. Kelly, I think you're muted. Got it. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. <laughs> okay, good. Sorry about that. Uh, so what we did, we have really good uh, permitting data, data from the city of Spokane, so I applaud them for that. So what the next couple of slides are going to do is showing uh, permitting activity with respect to uh, residential building permits. We are able to break that down into single family units and then multi-family units. Uh, what I'm going to be presenting is both the number of permits uh, for the quarter and then also uh, in later slides, the value, the average value of uh, the permitted um, single family or multifamily houses. And then we also have uh, permitting building permit uh, numbers and value for non-residential, and that would be the commercial and public development. So we'll talk about that a little bit. Residential building permits in general, we think of this as a leading economic indicator. Uh, it tells us about how businesses and consumers are feeling uh, about the uh, economy in the near future. And if we see activity going up, that bodes really well for, you know, a uh, short run in a future for the economy. So it's a, a nice indicator to look at. When you're looking at this is single family graph right here, uh, notice the purple bars again. So the absolute numbers and then the red line gives us the year to year change from the same order previous year. Um, and you'll see the, there is also, keep in mind, a very cyclical nature to residential building permits, especially up north here in Spokane, where we don't do a lot of construction in fourth quarters and first quarters. The ground is uh, frozen in many cases. Uh, so the dip, um, the big dip in the purple is not too worrisome, uh, you know, because that would be quarter four and quarter one. But the dip at the uh, end at the two bars on the far right are significantly lower than the other ones on the left. That is a significant fall off in the number of permits due to the pandemic in 2020. Uh, so we are down overall over the year 2020, uh, as can be expected. Um, those are real negative numbers. You can see <laughs> down there, negative 30 some percent, right? Um, so yeah, really down, really took a hard hit last year. Um, but a sneak peek again, the preliminary numbers I saw for our first quarter um, is total number for uh, quarter one, which normally is not a really strong quarter, like I said, because it's still January, February being cold, is 115 permits. Uh, we had in first quarter of 21. So that, again, is a really strong signal to us economists that that many permits were filed for that early in 2021. So we hope that that can continue, at least in the single family units. Let's look at the multifamily. Here's the multifamily, a lot more volatility. And as you notice, the numbers, uh, absolute numbers are actually a lot smaller uh, than the single family. So this is, you know, all over the place, again, down, um, one quarter we had up, but uh, in general, down overall um, from previous. Um, again, not much to say because of the usual volatility, right? But 2020 uh, did show, surprisingly, for the multifamily, a little bit more than 19, so not as big a hit as the single family did, uh, but still um, some slow growth in here. Okay? Next, the, what is interesting is we can also track, oh, go on to the average value. Yeah, the average value. We have a lot of single family uh, permits, right? Uh, we're interested in what uh, value of housing that they are constructing or they have applied for with their permits. And so you can see that there's a steady increase. Um, some of that might be, as you know, the, the median home resale value, right, uh, is up uh, significantly in Spokane. The uh, housing market is going crazy. Um, and so some of that, you can see that they are building houses that are a little bit higher uh, price. And it's in line with those values at the end are in line with uh, what we're seeing for the average price of a house in, in the county. 
Um, so yeah, you can see that the average value is increasing, and that's what those purple bars, they're just showing that upward trend at the end. So that's good news. And then the multifamily unit, again, all over the place, a lot more volatility. Again, we have a lower number of permits. Um, so it really just depends, you know, where it is and uh, what kind of a multifamily unit uh, they are building. Um, and so you can see the first three quarters of 2020 actually saw growth in the value, uh, but it hasn't gone back to its previous levels uh, before the pandemic. And so that's the, the takeaway with the multifamily unit stuff. A little more volatility and uncertainty there. The commercial and the public uh, development, so non-residential permits in this. Council member Cathcart has a question. Oh, go ahead. Just, just real quick, wondering uh, your three family numbers, are those for profit and non-profit developments? They don't make a distinction. Between okay, the, thank you. the data did not allow me to make that distinction. <laughs> I, I apologize. <laughs> On the, oh, non, non residential, sorry, here we go. Uh, and so this would include commercial and industrial, um, as well as keep in mind this does uh, include public work. Any schools, any cell towers, or hospitals, uh, that's counted as public development, and that is uh, lumped in with the total non residential permits. So we've got both private sector and public sector going on here. Uh, again, the noticeable cyclical behavior, right? Uh, you can see the Q4 and Q1, not a lot, or not as much as the Q2 and the Q3. And if you look at Q3 of 2020, uh, we were in the pandemic, uh, and it was only slightly lower than it was the previous year in 2019 quarter three. Uh, so it seemed to weather uh, the effects of the pandemic uh, pretty well, is what I'm seeing uh, with that one. And then the value and the next slide, uh, this was interesting. Uh, you can see that huge spike there. Uh, that was, there were five school projects that were all permitted at the same time. <laughs> and so in the one quarter, uh, $112.5 million worth of uh, school improvements, uh, new buildings and improvements were in that one. So that's that huge spike. That's an outlier. Of, otherwise, uh, you can see that the data is uh, much lower for the quarters. And again, a little bit of the um, cyclical, but you can see um, nothing too remarkable, nothing to be too concerned, I don't think, about uh, in this slide. Okay, thank you, Kelly. I, 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 we're, uh, we're running low, uh, we're running late here, so Council Member Stratton, I, uh, I think I'll just try to wrap up. I've got several slides, but probably don't have enough time to explain them. Um, Let's go ahead and go through as quick as you can, but I would really like um, to schedule some more time to have you come back when you have some solid numbers for 2021, because this is this is really helpful information. So okay. let's get okay. through this and, and um, we'll take it from there. Okay, I'll just, I'll just do a couple here. Um, this is looking again at city level data. Um, so these are taxable retail sales and um, you can see the, the purple bars uh, were at one point, they were over 1.5 uh, billion per, um, per quarter. And uh, then we hit uh, the pandemic and, and they quite haven't recovered. So uh, you are the orange line here with a uh, decline of uh, in the second quarter of uh, almost 11%. It did better. You uh, The city of Spokane performed better than the state, which was down 12.5%, but the county overall uh, did did better than both the state and the city at six about 6%. And I will say this, and this will be important as we look forward to trying to forecast what the city might be doing. Believe it or not, the city's taxable retail sales correlates very highly with the state's taxable retail sales. So uh, we, can, we can piggyback on uh, some of the forecasts we see for the state to try to give you a sense of what the city might see. Um, I'll do this slide and then I'll wrap up. Um, this is looking at the seven sectors that are the, the most, that contribute the most to taxable retail sales in the city of Spokane. In parentheses, they're ranked um, one, two, three, and so on. And uh, there's something called retail trade, which is what most of us associate retail sales with. But let's remember that in this state, construction is taxed, 
the hospitality business is taxed, uh, wholesale trade is taxed, and health services in part are taxed, uh, parts of the information sector are taxed and others. So it's very clear looking at this bar chart that there's a tale of two sectors here. And the first sector is the retail trade sector, which actually, believe it or not, over these seven, over these uh, three quarters in 2020, actually went up. That might surprise you, even though employment went down, sales went up. That, however, was, um, that effect was, was really wiped out by the decline in the hospitality business sales of 180 million. So overall, as I write here, uh, there was a decline of $145 million in the city of Spokane of taxable retail sales for those three quarters, or roughly a little less than 50 million per quarter. Let me just go through here and just say that if we believe that the city of Spokane seems to match retail sales taxes that come in from the state, I'll just point out that fourth quarter, you can see the state picked up 2% year over year, 2.2% or 1.4%. So I think that is in the offing for uh, once we get the final numbers from the Department of Revenue. And then I'll just point out that once we hit 2021, the state has shown some very robust figures of 7% and 7% essentially. So. Um, we wish we had the fourth quarter at least to show you, but if we believe that this is a pretty good correlate with the city of Spokane, then uh, the future looks much more promising in 2020 than it did in 2019. So to wrap up um, what Kelly and I have come up with for you all, uh, jobs uh, in the city uh, rebounded a, a, a quite a bit in the third quarter, but we're still below 2019, so no surprise there. Uh, Single-family residential permits uh, were substantially lower, uh, as Kelly showed, but multifamily permits were up. Um, Non-residential permit evaluation, believe it or not, was higher in 2020 through the first three quarters than 2019. Taxable retail sales, as we just went over, were down. Uh, and if the hospitality sector had had a better uh, experience, uh, they may not have been down at all. Um, and then um, I'll just leave it at that saying that uh, we hope to be able to provide a bit of a forecast uh, at the event that uh, Tanya is putting together sometime this spring about looking forward to 20, the rest of 2021 and 2022. So I'm sorry we took a little more time than we thought. This is the maiden voyage for this particular project or this particular report, but hope that this was able to give you some insights and some background information about uh, uh, kind of the resources you're dealing with. And we are then done. As I said, this is great information and um, we all appreciate it, but I did want to take a minute. Does anybody have any questions? that they want to ask Patrick or Kelly. Any, no questions? I can't see everybody, so just yell. Okay, thank you both. I see that um, we're gonna probably want some more information as, um, as you get more numbers. Sure. We'll work with Tanya on the event and um, to possibly schedule you for another update. This you bet, very, very you helpful. bet. Happy to do this. We're doing this now quarterly, so. If, if we don't present, you'll, I, I hope, at least see them. Okay, great. Well, thank you very, very much. Appreciate okay. your participation and all your hard work. Okay, our pleasure. Thank you so much. All right. Okay, we're going to move on. Matt Santangelo, are you? There he is. I see him. Okay, yeah. Matt is going to talk about the resolution supporting Hooptown USA designation. Take it away. Yep, so uh, I will go. I think, Kirsten Davis, do you want to say anything or you want me just to go for it? You can just go for it. I just tried to share my screen, but let me try to do that. So, but yep. you can you no can go ahead and get started. Yeah. All right, and I'll uh, try to go quickly. I love that uh, the previous presentation ended with looking forward to things that uh, with the rest of 2021. 
and things that help hospitality industry. And here's Hoop Fest. Woohoo! We can look forward to both those things. So that's pretty exciting. Um, but this is a little bit different. This is a um, our ask of the city to uh, kind of make the declaration that Spokane is actually Hooptown USA, a, an initiative we launched a couple years ago, um, and allow us to be able to place some signs around the city uh, tied to uh, walk and other places that kind of welcome people to Hooptown USA. Um, and again, I'll be I'll go pretty quick here, but I want to give some historical context on on specifically this initiative, not not tied to Hoop Fest, even though Hoop Fest is a pillar of Hooptown USA, um, but a little bit different. And so a couple of years ago, when Visit Spokane rebranded um, the city, they approached Hoop Fest, the organization, and said, you know, what do you think Spokane stands for? Um, I was the lucky person who answered that phone call, and I said, I think Spokane stands for a lot of basketball. Uh, you know, from my, my perspective, tied to Gonzaga basketball, um, and now tied to the broader community and basketball with all the things that Hoop Fest and this organization do, it's a really, really easy thing for me to kind of connect the dots that we care an inordinate amount for the sport of basketball, more than we should. And we have some really great world-class examples of that. Um, again, the great pillar of that is, is certainly Hoop Fest. Another great pillar of that is Gonzaga basketball. And so the more that we kind of dug on that, it's like, can we actually stand up and say are we are Hooptown USA, the more we realize how basketball kind of permeates a little bit of everything that we do. I mean, from high school basketball, multiple state championships just in recent years, CV girls, national championships in 2018, you know, down the line to youth basketball, we run out of this office, we're one of the largest youth AAU basketball programs in the country. Uh, you know, you start to look at uh, those athletes that have transitioned onto the collegiate level and then onto the professional level, both male and female. There's a really great story of the culture of basketball here in our town. But Hoop Town's a little bit more than that. And so when I started to think about other reasons why we could say this about ourselves, you know, you, you had to look at, so again, those two pillars, Gonzaga basketball, men's and women's, and Hoop Fest uh, as well. But the things that make those so special um, is not necessarily just the playing experience. This isn't just about playing basketball. It's about how the sport of basketball connects us as a community. It really kind of solidifies a piece of our identity here in, uh, in Spokane. And I can see that pretty readily from where I get to sit because, you know, the most impassioned fan base for Gonzaga basketball, again, ma male and female, men and women, is the retirement community. A lot of these people maybe never played basketball, but they know every recruit, Every recruits younger siblings. They know the name of the parents. I mean, they, they really, really get into, um, uh, you know, supporting those programs. And really the, the secret sauce to Hoop Fest, the other, one of the other pillars in Hooptown USA, is the volunteer effort. I mean, it's 3,000 volunteers that come together to be able to execute that awesome, awesome weekend. So you're really talking about not just the playing experience, but how the sport connects us and creates identity for us as a community. And that's ultimately... Uh, what launched Hooptown USA. Upon that launch in, uh, at Hoop Fest 2019, uh, it was immediately funded by MultiCare with a million dollar donation. Literally within, they were the first people we asked and they, uh, we had no idea that it would be that successful, but they saw the vision behind it and they brought money that otherwise would not have been in our community into our community through this initiative. And so that's the four kind of pieces to that initiative that we wanted to do. One was the Riverfront Park uh, complex, the north bank of the Riverfront Park, which we're going to open up, cut the ribbon on here in a couple weeks with, that has a couple of basketball courts that so that money helps fund. Another piece of that is the Hooptown Hall of Fame that will go exactly adjacent to those basketball courts at the north bank of the park um, under one of the shelters that are left over from the, the World's Fair. The third piece to that is all this community courts. So over the history of Hoop Fest, um, we've built 32 plus community courts and parks in the region. And part of that investment under Hooptown from MultiCare is to kind of refurbish and enhance those uh, park courts. You know, just last year we did Peaceful Valley where we installed artwork, public art. Uh, we installed public art at Chief Gary. Uh, we'll start, install public art this year at Thornton Murphy. Um, and of course at Riverfront Park again too. That's actually turned into other investments. The Spokane Indians Basketball Club wants to do a Native American court this year of their own investment. Um, and ironically, Oreo of Nabisco uh, wants to renovate a court as well. They called us and said, hey, we saw what you're doing with courts. Can we make an investment into the community as well? 
Um, and so that's really starting to gain some momentum. The fourth piece of that multi-care investment was really around this branding, this city branding, the city identity. So when people show up to Spokane, we have the assets in place to make it look and feel like Hooptown, USA. My example there is when you go to Nashville and you get off of the airport in Nashville, Tennessee, you get hit over the head with country music. You know exactly where you're at. And so how do we create that asset, those assets here in Spokane and you know, through this office, so that when State B comes, when the NCAA tournament regionals come, you know, when, when the next time North Carolina comes or these big college basketball programs coming to play Gonzaga, can we effectively flip the switch um, uh, to turn Spokane into Hooptown, USA? And that's where a lot of these city signs are a part of that. You know, these little reminders of the importance of basketball to our community, we think are really critical in solidifying this, uh, uh, this identity. And so that's where we're at. So I, I, I kind of reached back out. This is a conversation that started with the city about the time that we launched Hooptown USA in 2019, uh, but wanted to come back around because of the success of Gonzaga basketball this year. Um, that, you know, that train doesn't look like it's slowing down anytime soon. Now with the number one recruit, you know, when, when Chet Holmgren's family shows up in the fall to go to be on campus for his freshman year, we want them driving into Hooptown USA. We want them to know exactly where they're at and why we believe in it. Um, we think that this leads on to a lot more investment, a lot more awareness into our community, um, as it already has shown that it, it can and, and has done. Uh, and this is just the next step. So that puts me at six minutes because I had a timer. So we're going to give you guys a few minutes back on your uh, lunch meeting. I'm not even going to go through the rest of the slides. Kirsten Davis just went to this next one because she loves this slide. We're only missing, I think, four states in the history of Hoop Fest that have not come to Hoop Town, USA. Uh, for the best basketball week on earth, those little gray states. So if you know anyone from those little gray states, tell them to get out of here. Um, this slide here, just kind of what those signs will look like. Um, and there's another uh, uh, slide that she'll show that really shows it. So this is kind of what we're trying to do is try to highlight exactly what, uh, you know, when you're coming in, it's just another little reminder of where exactly you're at and what our belief is what that little fabric of our identity and why it's important to us. And we have a question from Council Member Mum. Yep. Hi there. Thanks for this. I love it. I actually um, worked with a group to try to get Spokane named Sports City USA because, you know, it's only one of many sports that we do here. But yep. let's start with Hooptown. I'm, I'm willing <laughs> to back it. But just a couple of things. I noted on your uh, mock-ups that you were looking at, you know, signs initially being placed at high speed areas, 30, 40, 50, 60 miles an hour. I'm a little concerned actually that that sign's too small. I can okay. read the hoop town, but honestly the icon, I'm sure someone worked really hard on designing that graphic. I can't tell what it is. Yeah. And I, I just want to help, I really do. So one idea was to change some color, instead of just black and white, put, some, put basketball orange in the little basketball or just use an orange basketball instead of that nice graphic, which I'm sure someone's going to be really disappointed I said that. But, we, you know, it's a basketball. We know what a basketball looks like. You're going by 50, 60 miles an hour. you got to be able to read it and see it. So you got to do the speed test when you do that. But I support it. I'd love to see it not just black and white, but a basketball background on there because the color says everything. And I really want to support this, and I hope it's more than just three signs. <laughs> I do too. But this is the uh, Candace. I really appreciate the feedback. The look and feel can totally change to be more effective in the space that it is. That's an easy one. Um, and really, we want it to be more than three signs too. But we got to start somewhere. And I think having your support uh, from the city and from the council um, will open up those avenues and those doors for us to really figure out how to strategically get these things out there and all those, um, not just the high speed areas, but some low speed areas too, but I think uh, this is just the first step for us is getting it on your radar and, and addressing the, the points that aren't as strong and make them stronger, but ultimately asking for your support in order to do it. Who else wants to make a comment or ask a question? Matt, do you want to touch real quickly on um, the, uh, the conversations with Washington Department of Transportation as well, that that's also you know, they, they're wanting to participate as well. Yeah, so when we initially um, approached the city, we got, we kind of did a little bit of um, uh, research trying to figure out who those, kind of those stakeholders, and we got introduced into WashDOT, um, uh, 
and to someone who was all for it. So he was great in kind of helping us, you know, put together the graphics, understand where the signs are, um, you know, so we have their support, I guess is what I'm trying to say, uh, in bringing this to life. So th that was, it was a nice kind of um, fortuitous, I guess, uh, uh, introduction into WashDOT to have their support before we got to this level. Perfect. Anybody else? Well, Matt, it does look like you um, will probably have more than one sponsor for this resolution. Thank so you. we appreciate both of you joining us and sharing this information and getting everybody all excited about more basketball. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's what we do. It's what we, I know it's, it's limited it's, focus, but it's what we do. And you do it very well and we appreciate it very, very much. So thank you for yeah, your time. You. And um, I believe if somebody from staff will get in touch with you as far as the, um, who's going to sponsor it. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Okay, we're going to move along to turf management with Al and Carl. We have Al. We do have Al. Where's Al? There's Carl. Okay. Al is there somewhere. Oh, there you are. Good to see you both. Okay, go ahead, and you have about 10 minutes. Good to see you as well. I am Al Vorderbruggen, Director of Park Operations for the City of Spokane, and Carl Strong, the Assistant Director for Park Operations, will be participating in this presentation as well. So uh, I'll let him introduce himself when he gets to the next slide. But uh, this is just a, a, a very high-level view of a project that you may have been at least alerted to through some of the, the various uh, different committees and such. This is. Um, what we're calling a conservation and natural turf solutions project at Chief Gary Park. It's uh, officially titled the Natural Turf Management Program. And what you're gonna see through this is a, uh, a, an intro to natural turf management for the Parks Department. Um, we, you know, we've had a history of using a variety of substances to battle weeds and pests and such things. This is our first real strong attempt at a solid pilot project to test out some of the natural solutions and see how it could obviously benefit the city um, and also be conceived as a um, kind of a test garden for what we can show the public and other agencies throughout town and other partners and stakeholders as well. So what we're going to do through this project is document the existing physical conditions of the turf areas at this park and then establish a baseline for the soil analysis and chemistry, texture, and nutrients available, and then assess that and come up with a plan on how to best battle this particular site. And what you'll learn through this short presentation that we've got here, that every site's a little bit different, but with this particular pilot project, we're gonna learn everything we can about the turf and soil at this particular property and, and use this as a pilot that can help us conceivably mimic it throughout the parks um, system and um, you know even with the school districts and other city departments and all sorts of other partners throughout the city. So with that brief intro, I will turn it over to Carl for slide two. If he's talking, I can't hear him. Thank you, Al, there we uh, go. for getting me on track here. And then uh, also just to add before getting into the, uh, to this next slide, uh, just one thing that uh, uh, to kick this off, it really pairs well with some of the individual things we've been doing uh, throughout the system for a while. Um, you know, we've got some pollinator gardens, water reduction programs with the city, some Spokanescape stuff we've been working on. So uh, it's a nice way to kind of bring it to, together and move us forward. So with that said, uh, I'm Carl Strong with the City of Spokane Parks Department, Assistant uh, manager for park operations. And our project team, uh, the planning team consists of Andy Thu, he's our grounds for person, myself, Al Vorderbergen, uh, Kara uh, Odegaard, Kristen Angel, and then uh, Candace Watkin. And then uh, brought in were uh, Jay Feldman and Chip Osborne. They're from a, a, an organization called Beyond Pesticides, it's something they do across the nation. They do presentations uh, on organic and natural uh, processes with landscaping. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Carl. Um, the plan, what we've come up with here for this natural turf management um, 
plan pilot project at Chief Gary. And obviously, Chief Gary is on Mission Avenue, uh, east east of the river, near Spokane Community College. I'm sure you all know that, but if we have any guests that might not know it, it's on a, a pretty visible thoroughfare here in Spokane. Again, this is a pilot project. We're, we actually have two sites within Chief Gary. One is the, the big ball field that was pictured in slide one, and you'll see it again at the end. And that's where we have three um, Little League ball fields side by side, very high use, at least for baseball and some softball. But it gives us a good example of what a sports field um, can do in regards to natural turf management. And uh, we also have another area near the splash pad in the middle of the park, if you're familiar. And I probably should have thrown that up on the on a slide. I apologize for that. But it's another area near the splash pad. And that's a completely different type of use. That's where the kids are congregating. They're carrying water off of the splash pad inadvertently or otherwise. And it's a completely different treatment of the soil there. And our thought here is that we can look at two different places within the same park with similar structures of the soil. It's a little bit different because of the, the ball field slightly different, but it'll give you a good idea and give us a good idea going forward on two different applications for this natural solution. And obviously when we say natural, we're trying to get away from synthetics. We're trying to get away from the man-made products, which are pretty prevalent. They're typically less expensive, um, but they're pretty prevalent, obviously in, in society uh, and in parks programs throughout. You know, budget's always an issue for us, but um, we're going to test this thing out and see how close we can get to a natural solution without all the synthetics. So, as mentioned before, we're going to increase the natural matter of the soil. That's where the, the microbes live out, right? We're going to establish the timeline. We're going to do extensive soil testing before, after, during. We're going to do so many soil samples, they're going to get tired of seeing our stuff come in their way. Um, we're, with our, the 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 partners that Carl mentioned from Beyond Pesticides and, and uh, Osborne Organics, we're going to um, use their national list of prohibited substances and, and what we should stay away from and, and what's allowed. Um, we're going to look at what's called a system approach, and that's really the opposite of a product approach. Instead of having the product determine how we're going to treat things, we're going to have the ecosystem of that particular land mass, or this in this case, these ball fields or the turf near the the splash pad, that's going to tell us what we need to do. We're going to look at the soil. We're going to look at what it needs below the ground to make what we see above the ground much healthier. So it's a, it's a completely different approach, probably outside, honestly, of our comfort zone of, of some of the staff and, and different people that have been working on this. But we're willing to take this on and really take a look at this and see how we can at least give this our best shot reducing the, the man-made chemicals applied in these parks and see if we can pull this off with a more natural solution. So you'll see regular follow-up. There's going to be multiple you know, inspections. There's various expectation levels that can come out of these. In fact, we might even within these two test plots at the park, we might have different expectations for each one. We might have, you know, obviously for a ball field, you're going to have different expectations from the beginning. And a low expectation doesn't necessarily mean that's a bad thing. That just means we have to put a little bit less material and less natural solutions into that part of the park. And of course, we can do that. That's a win-win for everybody. But some of these are going to take a little bit more intense. The goal mouth on a, on a soccer field, as you all know, is a very high use area. And we'll get into compaction a little bit later in this presentation. But it's a little bit different treatment there than you're going to see in, even in the outfield of a softball field or whatever. So each area we're going to look at a little bit different. We're going to have different, different expectations and there's nothing wrong with that. And of course, ultimately, one of our goals really is to make more trainings available, working with our new partners, expanding this with your assistance through the city council and the city park board on making some more natural solution trainings available to other city departments. We've already reached out and working pretty closely with those working on the right of ways and the wellheads and, and different turf areas around the city. And of course, we have partners at the school district. We have partners with Spokane Indian Youth Baseball and the Spokane Indians and various others, churches or what have you, and we could partner with some of them on some extensive training because we'd really like to become a model for what can be done for a natural solution instead of just throwing man-made pesticides at it. Feel free, Councilman Stratton, to, Council Member Stratton, to, to yell at me if you have any questions along the way, anybody else for that. I just had a quick question. Um, so as you're going through this process, are you involving the neighborhood councils over in Northeast Spokane near the park? We haven't yet, but I think you'll see that coming down the pipe okay. as we start to expand it. You'll see this is a three-year project and we'll okay. 
we're really at the infant stages here, but I think once we start getting some data, this is a very data-driven process. As we get the data and results, we'll be sharing it with you, the park board, and many others. That's a, that's a really good chance to reconnect with the neighborhood and make sure they understand, because in some cases, and we'll get into this a little bit later, we're actually going over the, making more passes on the jerk, not less. So they're gonna see us out maybe being a little bit more intense, because sometimes with the natural solutions, it's not just go by one time with the spray, you have to go over it multiple times with different types of remedies. Right. So you're right, you'll see a different pattern for our employees while we're out there. Great, okay, we got about two and a half minutes left. We're there. Carl, you're up. <laughs> Thank you, so our process, we, we met uh, in 2019 uh, in late in that year with uh, Kirsten and Kara. And Kirsten's a representative from the community uh, and uh, also is on the, the uh, Audubon Neighborhood Council, so we have got a good connection there to, to start that uh, uh, neighborhood connection. Uh, then we moved into virtual meetings because of COVID, and we're just trying to digest what this what this means. What does this mean to the parks? What, what's the ask, and, and how can we come together to to move something forward on, on a potentially larger scale as we get through this? Um, we had questionnaires uh, as far as our current past practices, and then we chose Chief Gary as our test site um, to. Uh, Sorry, I lost you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> we thought it was a great, uh, a great test site. It had multiple uh, uh, amenities in the park. It was close to our, our, our work uh, so that we can mobilize there very quickly and be effective in, in doing these processes, such as aerating, as you see the picture here. Um, and then part of that, like Al said, was testing the soil. We needed to get that to Jay and Chip so that they can analyze it and give us feedback uh, to, get, to, to give us a direction. And then um, from there, just looking at uh, you know, the cultural intensities, uh, regular written reports, uh, project summary, and then eventually we want to move into duplicating this in other sites. So we're gonna move through this process. Uh, we've already started this year uh, with the actual turf management, aerating and, and whatnot, and uh, wanting to continue that over the next couple of years. Al? And along those lines, uh, keeping in the timeline, this is our last real slide here, so we'll stay on schedule. You know, essentially this came, it's interesting that Kirsten and Kara came to me even in the winter of 2019 before I involved Carl and others, and, and I think they were happy to see that we aren't just out there throwing chemicals willy-nilly. It's a, actually a cost issue for us. We don't have the, the funding to throw a lot of chemicals at stuff anyway, so I think we were in a better situation at the beginning than they thought we were. So from the beginning stages of 2019 all the way through now, as Carl mentioned, we've done some of the initial work, as you can see on this timeline. Uh, you know, right now we're coming up on the, the summer, fall, uh, next second iteration. That's kind of where we're coming back to you. And I think part of the, the reason we were asked to come forward is your council um, has allotted us $6,000, I believe, for this project. And we spent that this spring. So our, our plan is to come back with this um, this fall with a second application. I think there's going to be a formal ask of y'all at some point to help with that funding. The $6,000 was basically just for the product. It wasn't for all of our extra man hours put into this and, and that type of thing. So that's going to be the ask ultimately. It may not be from today, but it'll be later on. Um, but that's kind of where we're at right now is we've got this thing going. We feel good about where we're at right now. We're working with the experts from all around the United States that's done this many, many times. And we're gonna bring it to Spokane and we're gonna try to make this cool. We're gonna make this Turp Town USA it's going to be natural turf down USA. Take that, Matt said, Tangelo. There you go. That's it. I'm open for questions. Does anybody have questions? Okay, so we look forward to seeing the request. But I do want to let both of you know that was just as exciting as Hoop Town. Thank you. That Purpose was great cool too. information, and I know you're working hard, and we appreciate it, and thank you so much for the presentation. All right. We're always here if you need us. Thanks for having Scott, us. We know who to ask if we have questions. <laughs> Anytime. Okay, moving on. We are going down to council requests now, and Brian McClatchy, is he here? I didn't see him. I'm here. Can you hear me? Here you are, Brian. Okay, you're going to take it away with amending regulations for the reuse of historic properties. Great. Thank you. Um, first of all, I wanted to make sure that council members know that the briefing paper doesn't have a council sponsor on it, but this is being sponsored by council member Wilkerson. Um, myself and Megan Duval from the Historic Landmarks Commission um, have collaborated to draft this 
proposed emergency ordinance, and I can walk through um, very briefly what it does. Um, the main thing that this ordinance would do is it would clarify some ambiguity in the code right now that refers to historic reuse of historic structures. Um, and the word structures and the word property are used sort of in a sort of confusing or vague way. So the main thing this ordinance does is clarify that we're talking about properties, which means everything that's on the parcel rather than just the structure itself. Um, the other main thing that this ordinance would do is it would take uh, the Historic Landmarks Commission and place them into a stronger uh, position in terms of um, determining whether the, the property can be reused um, for it and by putting them into the certificate of appropriateness process. And it restricts the uh, types of properties that can be reused under the code to those that are listed on the Spokane Register rather than those that are listed on the National Register. That way the City Historic Landmarks Commission has a little bit more uh, ability to make sure that we're preserving properties and reusing them uh, in the right way, connected to the neighborhood and connected to the property. I don't see Megan on the call, but does Councilmember Wilkerson have anything that she'd like to add since she is the sponsor? Thank, thank you, Brian. And uh, it was brought to my attention, and many of the older buildings are in our downtown core and as we continue to look toward housing options, what can we do to preserve the historic uh, perspective of those buildings, but also make a place for people to live? And like Brian said, uh, as many things in our code is confusing, but we felt this is something we could partner on to move this forward uh, as we look at development, maintain the historical structure and the value of those buildings. So thank you, Brian. Happy to field any questions. Does anybody have any questions for Brian or Betsy? Okay, I think we're good and we know who to call if we do have questions. Thank you both for the presentation. We're going to move forward to a COPS update. And Tracy, I'm here. Is we're, we're Tracy and Patrick? Yes, I'm, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you and see you. I see you both. So we're going to go ahead and um, I hope you talk a little bit about the bicycles because that's pretty cool and I'm pretty excited. Uh, the bicycle patrol? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I got a couple quick updates for you and then I'm going to have Tracy talk to you about our crime victim advocates and the great stuff they're doing. Um, this weekend's the off road patrol partnered with. Uh, Spokane River Keepers, and it was a great event to get out into some of the rural parks and areas and clean up. Um, we realized last summer that the River Keepers are doing a lot of cleanup, um, but they're having to mule everything out of there by hand, and so we used the off-road patrol, uh, and we're able to shuttle everything out of there and make a huge uh, difference with them to help get more. So we had a great event this weekend to clean it up. A lot of garbage and debris out there, and since a big part of crime prevention is the broken windows theory and that neat, clean areas are a crime uh, deterrent, and conversely, um, uh, debris-filled, graffitied areas are a crime attractive. This is a good thing for us to be a part of, so we had a lot of fun, and we're going to be working with them every month now, uh, cops and the river keepers, to keep trying to keep that stuff clean. So I think that's a really cool thing. Uh, we do have a new program. We are, um, I'll be releasing it here in just a couple of weeks, the Bike Patrol I've had a lot of my volunteers express interest in getting out to Centennial Trail, getting out to some of the areas uh, where they can ride bikes, areas where you see a lot of you know, car break-ins, things like that, and having a presence. And so we've started putting that together. Uh, in fact, I'm working with the Spokane City Credit Union. They've got a commercial we just put together that's uh, kind of promoting this, a lot of great stuff. Um, and that's the thing you'll hear more from me on that. Uh, but I don't want to take up too much time because what I really want to do is turn it over to Tracy, uh, who's going to update you on some of the great things um, and resources that our advocates do for victims of crime. Uh, because we all know sometimes if you've been victimized, it can be really daunting in terms of what do you do now? How do you get your life back in order? How do you make sure this doesn't happen again? Uh, and needing someone to take you by the hand. And so Tracy is going to tell you about some of the great things they're doing for victims right now. Over to you, Tracy. Can hold on real quick, Patrick, before we yeah. make that transition, Councilmember Mom has a question. Oh, 
Yes. Oh, I just wanted to say that we're beefing up our bicycle purchases for our city police. And I'm just thinking you guys might be a nice downstream when they're done with an e-bike. Um, mm -hmm. And sure. out uh, or the other bikes that they are using, I would like to keep those in house if we couldn't and see if you could maybe get them. Oh yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, good. That's good. Right. Okay, take it away, Tracy. Hey, thank you, thank you, Patrick, thank you, Karen. Um, and so I've been doing the crime victim advocates uh, uh, position here for going on two years now, and I just kind of want to remind you all of what our um, what our unit is doing. Um, we are able to I, work with all kinds of victims of crime. We're no longer just um, mandating identity theft and fraud. We do scams and different assaults. We do all kinds of different orders, uh, anti-harassment orders, protection orders. Um, we work with neighbors and neighborhood issues. We work with harassment situations, bullying, burglary, hate crimes, property crimes, which there's a ton of, and, and robberies and, and such. Um, our referrals come all over the place. They come from the police department, the behavioral health unit, neighborhood resource officers, um, phones from our cop shops, from emails, from social media, uh, other agencies, landlords, and really the neighborhoods reach out quite a bit to us um, in assistance. Um, I, I wanted to give you one example that just came in the last few weeks. It was with an elderly couple. It will just give you an example of what we can do as a, as a victim advocate. Um, I came in as a Spokane Police Department referral. I had very little in, uh, information on it. I do know it was an elderly couple and it involved a robbery. Um, within 24 hours, I had made contact with them. I had set up a meeting to go out in person within 48 hours. Um, we abided by the COVID restrictions and guidelines. Um, once I went there and met with them, I was able to establish what their needs were. Um, I was able to spend about an hour with them of just talking about what transpired and what did they really need and what did that look like. Um, I was able to establish what their support system looked like. Did they have family or friends in Spokane were they, were they really on their own? So I was able to establish that. Um, then we started working on a game plan, uh, just kind of talk about where their property was at and how long their property would not be um, with them and, and just kind of talked about those kinds of goals. Um, safety plan, um, obviously with it being a robbery, we had great concerns about the safety um, of their home and being elderly uh, to add on top of that. While I was there, I was able to do a crime prevention through environmental design, otherwise known as SEPTED. And so I was able to take a look at their house, uh, noted it was incredibly well manicured and well taken care of. Um, but also what was unique is at this age, this generation, they did not have Wi-Fi, they did not have smartphones. So let's take a look at a security system and what is that going to look like? Um, let's talk about signage, lighting, what your lights look like, um, those kinds of things. We have an emergency fund account. I was able to purchase those game cameras, um, which run off of batteries and SD cards, um, able to purchase signs that say you're under surveillance camera, uh, driveway alarms. I love driveway alarms. They're 10 bucks right now on sale at Harbor Freight. Um, but they're good indicators, but they're great for that generation that doesn't have Wi-Fi and what do these security systems look like outside of that. Um, we're able to install these, these things for them, and then I was able to contact the family and verify that they would be able to monitor the game cameras for this elderly um, couple. It was at that time I updated the detectives on what all I had accomplished so far, and then we, on top of it, provided a neighborhood observation patrol. So that's a real good example in a very short time frame of all the different things that Spokane Cops was able to offer up to this elderly victim. Um, one nice thing about being a crime victim advocate is that we have the ability to meet folks in person. Uh, we can go to their home. We have a wonderful office um, at our crime
Am I the only one that can't hear her? No, oh, I'm not sure what happened there. Maybe we didn't pay our internet bill. I have no idea. I'll start talking until she gets back on. Uh, I think where she was going with that is the advocates um, are not necessarily hurried and, you know, in and out, get your information and go. Our advocates can take the time uh, to meet with victims, whether it's a 15 minute conversation. We've had victims, uh, some domestic violence victims or whatever that have needed those protection orders and stuff where it's been hours and hours of working with them to get them safe. Um, and that's something our advocates can do. And then as Tracy said, keep updating the detectives, get them that information so that uh, we can bring it to resolution through the court system or whatever needs to happen. Uh, but the advocates do such great things that the story that Tracy just told you was, um, I think, very impactful um, for this couple that had, uh, I'm not going to go into details, but it was not a good situation. The robbery uh, it included an assault on uh, the gentleman and um, you know, had an elderly gentleman and um, he got uh, physically assaulted pretty bad by uh, his assailants that were in his home. And so that's why we took it so seriously, but to be able to provide all the services that we've done uh, for them to help make sure it's not going to happen, uh, give them that sense of confidence of this is a one-off. We can help uh, really reduce your risk. Uh, you need not live in fear. We're going to help you through this. We've got, like she said, those uh, not patrols now that are patrolling their houses all the time, which they see. Uh, we're in contact with their family, keeping them in the loop. And so there are so many things that our um, advocates can do. And I don't know how many people in the community are really aware of all the things that our advocates do, but um, my job is just to turn them loose, and we've got a couple fighters on the team that will do anything for their uh, for their community and for those victims, and so they make a huge, huge impact. Uh, I know Tracy had more things, but she's not back on, so um, do you guys have any questions for me about what our advocates can do? Patrick, I do have one question. When we get calls from constituents in our district, and we think that it might be something that a that an advocate could help out with, you know, touch base with them. Do we go directly to COP, or is there somebody in SPD that we have to work through? Don't just send them. Uh, you can send them to me, and I can filter it down from there. Uh, you're always free to do that. As Tracy said, some of our um, victims are coming from SPD's referrals. A lot of them come through the cop shops. We'll get somebody that comes in, tells us about a situation. Um, we get about 20,000 plus people a year that come through the cop shops. Most of the time our volunteers can help them, but sometimes you get something that the volunteer recognizes. I, I think this is going to need a little bit more than I as a volunteer can offer. They'll send it off to the uh, advocates. Usually, as Tracy said, within 24 hours, we've made contact. Um, and are already talking them through the process and then typically have a meeting set up. But yeah, any victim that you hear about, and it doesn't even have to be a, and I love this, it, it doesn't even have to be an, uh, an actual victim of crime, someone who identifies as a victim who, you know, for instance, we've had um, children work with us where maybe they've been victims of, of hate crime, but it's, you know, law was necessarily broken, but it was still a horrible situation. Send them to us because we can work with them, get them resolution and, and uh, help on that. And, so it doesn't even have to reach a very high status, just someone that um, has been victim victimized in one form or another. And you go, I think this person needs uh, somebody to take them by the hand and help right this wrong. And that's what we do. Okay, does anybody have any questions for Patrick? Patrick, thank you so much. Um, why don't you give us your phone number just in case anybody needs to call you? Yeah, absolutely. 24 hours a day, I'm always open. 509-280-5623 is a great number to call me or text me or just shoot me an email, pstriker at spokanecops.org. Uh, usually I'm pretty responsive and, and we can get on things really quickly, especially when victims are concerned. And please thank Tracy for us. This is great information. And if you haven't, again, if you haven't been by to visit their new administrative offices, please do. It's, it's worth the drive and it's nice to sit down and talk to them in their space. We love companies. So come on down. Yeah, bring the bring cookies, though. <laughs> That's right. That's what Karen does. It works every time. I know. I know. I know where to get them. Okay. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, and thanks, thanks, Tracy. Okay. So next, we're going to go to Melissa and Alex. We're going to talk about the one of the topics with the Housing Subcommittee is um, stipends for individuals that serve on the committee. And I'm going to turn it over to Melissa and Alex. I see you both. Hi there, I am going to start sharing my screen. Um,
Alex, do you want to start? I am just trying to find my the PowerPoint. <laughs> Well, it looks like you found the PowerPoint, so hi, everybody. Um, we see the PowerPoint. Okay, so I know this is a discussion that we had with a lot of you individually, just um, the idea about providing stipends to folks that are um, members on the Housing Action Subcommittee. So Alex and I um, kind of tried to synthesize a lot of your, um, a lot of the council members' feedback into a very draft proposal and discussion um, to see if we're on the right track and if there's anything that we should add or um, any questions that you might have. So just a quick overview of what the members' roles on the Housing Action Subcommittee will be. Um, they would be appointed by council and really are to be the, the community voice um, in a formal communication channel between um, the City of Spokane and council. So providing ideas, um, recommendations, and also some community oversight to the spending of the sales and, um, sales and use tax for affordable housing. Um, we're also really trying to have members on the Housing Action Subcommittee that do have lived experience um, with housing instability, housing discrimination, and that have not traditionally been a part of other formal uh, city boards, commissions, or advisory committees. And so a way to, to do that and to intentionally recruit those community members um, looking at a stipend to help offset some of their cost of participation. And so Alex is going to walk through a little bit about this community engagement spectrum. Yeah, so this community engagement spectrum is from the International Association for Public Participation. And really just wanted to call it out how our advisory committees are in the collaborative space um, that you can see over here. But as some of the best practices, and you can see along the budget examples, that some stipends are usually uh, used as best practices, but mostly those are around parking or travel. And for us thinking, how do we remove some of the barriers uh, for uh, low income individuals? You know, maybe providing a stipend for them in that space uh, would be helpful. You know, other barriers could be like child care, uh, you know, preventing residents from being able to participate. And Melissa, if you want to go to the next slide. And so um, we looked at other examples of how other cities and municipalities are providing stipends to participants. Um, from the MRSC, you can see that most government advisory boards in the state of Washington um, do not provide any kind of stipends or compensation. Um, there's a couple of smaller cities that do for their planning commission, um, and those I think were the city of Duval, city of Bonnie Lake, so some of the smaller cities in um, the state of Washington. Around the country, um, there are a lot of cities that do kind of across the board provide stipends or compensation. The city of LA provides $50 a meeting um, to any member on any of their boards or commissions. And the city of Olympia um, just back in April started providing um, stipends to their advisory committees at $25 a meeting and then $50 a meeting if they're low income. Um, we've reached out to the city of Olympia to request some information about how they've implemented that since their program has just started a few months ago. Um, and so when we get more information, we can share it. And so the, the proposal that Alex and I, um, in talking with um, some stupid Alexander and some of the council members, what we were looking at for the Housing Action Subcommittee is $25 a meeting or work group um, providing some bus pass um, help if, if individuals request it, um, providing the money on a gift card that can be delivered in a number of ways, so either by email, pick up in person, mailing um, to the address, whatever is the, the best for the individual, and looking at a, some qualifications about who could apply for the stipend. So looking at either um, an or of people, their household income, is less than 60% AMI, or they receive some sort of means-tested benefit. So SNAP, uh, food assistance, TANF, Medicaid, um, 
there's a variety of, of benefits that if someone is receiving those, they automatically would qualify because another agency has already verified their income. So really trying to look at what's an easy, straightforward way um, to do that, which wouldn't take a lot of staff time. Um, the next steps, if you know this looks like council is something that they would like to move forward with, is drafting a administrative policy um, to provide stipends to qualifying um, housing action subcommittee members. A very rough budget is about eighteen thousand dollars a year, and that's if thirty members of the sub subcommittee um, applied for the stipend and attended a meeting in a work group a month, so fifty dollars a month. Um, for 30 members. So um, I'm sure that it would be less than that. We haven't asked people what you know their incomes are yet. So um, I don't know how many people would apply, but that's just a, a high estimate for a stipend amount. And then um, finally is the proposal, or this is the discussion for council, um, just really wanting the feedback if these stipend amounts are on track, um, if the qualification requirements seem acceptable, um, if there's any other discussion or questions that you have for Alex and I or, or things that you need to tweak, um, we'd really like the feedback from council members. Council member Mum. Hi. Yeah, I, I like this idea as a pilot. Um, and I, I don't think a gift card is a good thing to do because we, people have to claim this as income. So I think we have to be careful a little bit uh, from a taxable basis on that. Uh, I, I do think that um, this is something we should look at in terms of other boards and commissions because we tend to seem to be having a lot of people who are either in this profession or paid to be kind of on our, some of our boards and that makes me feel uncomfortable. And I think this is a way to work to have better um, diversity and equity and outreach and um, that way this wouldn't be a barrier because childcare is an issue. and parking costs are included as well. So I think we talked about that. I don't know. I like the bus pass idea that promotes that. Um, but maybe even, uh, I know we have a, a parking allowance for some of our boards and commissions. We might be um, interested in including that as well. Councilman Cathcart. Yeah, thank you. I, I continue to think that if you're gonna do this, it should be a, a non-cash form of something. Um, I think the bus pass is a great idea, but if there's going to be something in addition to that, I just think it should be something that's non necessarily a, an actual cash benefit, maybe a, a voucher for helping with child care or something like that. Um, my other question though is what, I guess, will there be policies around how many meetings can be called since this is going to be a per meeting type benefit? So one meeting per month is all the subcommittees allowed or five or, you know, so I'm just curious on the parameters on that side of it and and uh, also what the selection i guess it, are there any concerns that that you guys have in terms of conflict of interest with regard to appointing members to the subcommittee because they're now potentially going to going to benefit from being um, on that subcommittee so i'm just kind of curious just about those things um i so for First part of the um, benefit and conflict of interest, I think if it's looked as kind of a reimbursement, um, they're, they're not necessarily making money, um, but the, the $25 a meeting is more of a reimbursement for their cost that they incur to attend the meeting. Um, what other cities have done to kind of limit the amount of stipends they're paying, um, Washington, D.C.'s Department of Disability Services, they limit it to $600 a year. So. Um, people can attend both meetings and work groups, but the, the amount that you can claim is limited to $600 a year. So that could be something if council wanted to put a limit on the amount of stipends that an individual could claim um, on a yearly basis. Councilmember Wilkerson. Thank you, and, and thank you, Melissa and Alex. Uh, I appreciate Councilmember Catcart's concern but we are really looking at how we expand the participation of our citizens at the city level. Now, for years, the state has the state does compensation for many of their boards and commissions at that level. So this is not something that's like totally brand new. Uh, it's new to us as we go forward. But I think with some of the guardrails that uh, Councilmember mentioned, 
that we should really be looking at because everyone is not privileged enough to have a position where they get paid just to take off uh, in the middle of the day, uh, which is another barrier for many of our boards and commissions that we are looking at this in a new holistic approach of how to engage our citizens. So let's do this. We are running short on time. I see Alex and Melissa both have been taking notes. So let's do this. For those of you that want to add more comments or have questions, go ahead and, and deal with them directly and we'll continue the discussion to deal with um, the concerns. Will that work for everybody? I think Council President Jakes really could wants I to speak. Could I just say one quick thing uh, because, so people know? So one is the idea on this is very few people are probably going to get it because most people who join our committees on this are doing it for work. But secondly, I just wanted to let people know that we did reach out to the administration because some other boards and commissions might wonder about it. And they told us they don't really want to talk uh, more broadly yet uh, until later in the year. But we did reach out to let them know since this might have an impact. And it looks like we'll probably go ahead, as Councilmember Mum says, on a pilot basis and see how it works, especially since we're targeting uh, this particular program. We want people who are more likely to have a lower income. So I just wanted to let people know that. And I'll follow up offline with everyone else. Thanks. Perfect, thank you. So follow up with um, either Melissa. Um, yeah, we'll do it that way because we're running out of time. Sorry, guys. All right, so I'm going to hand it over. Again, Melissa is popular today. Melissa and um, Councilmember Burke are going to talk about, we, I know all of us have had um, or heard, I've had calls, and I've also seen a lot in the news about downtown restrooms. So they... Um, happily volunteer to provide us some information to kind of get the conversation started. I'm going to turn it over to them. Thank you again. Um, and so we, um, Councilmember Burke and I discussed um, starting the conversation about developing a public restroom program for the city of Spokane. And so this is just going to be a very high level discussion with some ideas. Um, so we can really start to target and narrow down um, what we want the, the program to focus on and um, to do moving. I think you went on mute, Melissa, somehow. I did, sorry. And I moved myself one on. Um, so let me get back and I'll reshare my screen. Okay, so we wanted to frame this conversation about how public restrooms are really an infrastructure conversation. Um, I just took this definition of infrastructure from the Oxford Dictionary that we're really talking about the basic physical um, structures and facilities needed for the operation of a society. So as much as we don't enjoy talking about bathroom use and restrooms and why we use them, um, they really are necessary for everyday life and everybody uses them. So. Thinking about restroom accessibility, um, that public restrooms make the space more accessible to everyone. Um, we have had a lot of conversations around restroom use regarding people experiencing homelessness in the downtown area, which you know is an important piece of this conversation. But everybody downtown also needs access to a restroom, whether you're a parent with small children, you're a delivery driver, you have health conditions, you need to know where you can use the restroom that's going to be safe, clean, and usable. Um, so it's really a broader conversation of looking at how do we provide these very most basic of amenities in the public spaces. Um, when we don't have restrooms, it can make us sick. We all know that um, when we think about germ theory. And I think that has been especially highlighted through COVID when a lot of restrooms that people have used um, were closed during the COVID time. So it's really brought to light um, how much we have depended on private businesses to provide our public restroom spaces. Um, and finally, restrooms are really important to use as a safety mechanism. When you're using the restroom, you're taking care of private needs and you can be vulnerable. And so making sure that when we have restrooms, um, they promote safety for the people that are using them um, at that time. So 
when we when we think about why we have infrastructure, I think bathrooms have not been part of the conversation, but um, they really should be in. And how do we think about that as a city? Um, the next slide is some different uh, approaches other cities have taken. Um, so there isn't a one size fits all type of approach with the public restrooms. Um, up in the corner with business partnerships, that is a program in Germany where cities pay different private businesses to allow restroom use for anybody in the public. So the city will pay to help cover the cost of cleaning and um, the increased foot traffic into the restroom in exchange for putting a, a sticker on the window to let people know that anybody is allowed to use the restroom and they don't need to buy something um, just to help you know people know where they can go. Um, and then down the continuum, continuum of different restrooms, there's the porta potties, uh, the more permanent standalones, which are the Portland Loos that I know have been really popular that um, a lot of people in the community talk about. Um, there's some self cleaning options where you can use them, and then every, after every time someone uses it, they're they're clean. And then there's a staffed option, which has been used in San Francisco. Um, they call them their pit stops where they're situated in areas of the city that have a high um, population of individuals experiencing homelessness that have case managers on site um, who can provide some referrals to services um, at the bathroom um, that people are using. So there isn't necessarily a one option that would be best for Spokane. Um, I think there could be conversation about different types of options and putting different options in different places, um, but it's just thinking of creatively of how we want to address this issue. Um, and so finally is the discussion of, and some things that I've in my research about learning about public bathrooms. Um, some considerations is really looking at the number of restrooms um, and priority locations. One bathroom in downtown Town is not going to solve the, bath, the problem. Um, the city of Denver did a lot of research and studying about their public restroom program, and they found that people aren't going to walk a mile to use a public bathroom. So if you're really trying to address um, public bathroom use, you need to put bathrooms every few blocks. Just make sure that they're accessible to people, um, that they're easy to get to, they can see them, they're out on the sidewalk. Um, so they're not tucked away somewhere in a in a dark corner because you really want to make it accessible to the most people. And and the the finding has been in some other cities that the more people use them um, for a variety of reasons, the less trouble they have. So when they're just seen as kind of a normal part of the cityscape, um, they're less likely to draw um, unwanted attention. So. Um, Councilmember Burke and I wanted to bring this to everyone to discuss and talk about opportunities with potentially the recovery money of looking at um, the possibility of some public restrooms in the city of Spokane and partnerships and kiosks to really make these something that could serve the community. Yeah, and I'll just add that, um, you know, I've been working on this for a really long time. I think this could be a really cool partnership between Downtown Spokane Partnership and Visit Spokane and really incorporate how we can enhance the tourists and the downtown um, community's experience. Um, I know in CHHS department, we talked about getting those kiosks where people who are experiencing homelessness maybe have a card and they can swipe it and get all this information. We could do that on the outside of the bathroom and also have it have a map of Spokane with all of the highlighted local spots or things like that. So we could get really creative um, in doing some awesome stuff now, especially with technology advancing. You can literally just have a screen where you can press things. Um, and so I just I think it's a really cool, unique idea, and I think it could really enhance the downtown experience just all together, not just for a certain population. So. I'm hoping we can work with um, those entities to kind of bring them in on the discussion and try to see how we can enhance it for like, everybody who's um, enjoying that, that space down there. So. so here's what I'm going to suggest. I'll have Council Member Kinnear ask her question. And then because we have one more, we have Chris Becker um, coming up. What I would suggest is that Melissa and Kate be sure and send your um, PowerPoint out to all council members to remind them 
to get back to you with their with their thoughts and suggestions. So go ahead, Lori, and then we're going to move to. Um, okay, uh, quickly. It's not a question. Well, it is. Have you talked to Cupid at all? Because he's got some great ideas. So I would urge you to coordinate with him and um, so that we're more synergy. He's, he's from Portland, got great ideas, so I'd encourage you to talk to him. That's a great idea. Okay, so everybody keep that in your heads. Be sure you get your feedback to Kate and to um, Melissa. And we're gonna head to Chris Becker. Chris, I'm sorry, I forgot your name in the, like, the last 30 seconds. Go ahead, and I'm sorry that we're running late, but we're gonna turn it over to you to take us out. Yep, I can be very quick. Um, so uh, have some of the same data that Dr. Jones uh, went over earlier, looking at the building permit data. Um, and looking at it a little bit differently, um, so I have came to some different conclusions than he did. We're still very busy in the DSC. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to talk to him and see if they're looking at new and uh, remodels or just new or just, you know, um, and I'm not looking at it on the, the quarterly basis. So we're comparing year over year, but we'll get to that in a minute. Um, our total permit activity is up uh, 16%. Uh, we are still going gangbusters with um, uh, single family residences this year. Um, and our valuations continue to be up. Um, over 70% and we're um, up over 2019 as well. Um, and if you look along the bottom, you can see that we are seeing a steady increase in our um, online permit activity as we're moving more of our applications online. Um, so for uh, through April, uh, we are at 233 million. Um, This is the breakdown by project size. Um, we had some very large projects uh, come through, um, but a pretty decent breakdown um, between large and small projects there. This is the public versus private. We're still seeing significant uh, private investment. And you can see in 2020, we had the 240 million and that was those five schools that Dr. Jones mentioned and the libraries as well. We have we've uh, issued a permit for one of the new middle schools. We have the second middle school in for review right now. So for single family, uh, we are at 158 uh, in the first four months. It was 114 in March. Uh, so we uh, issued about 40 more. We have 72 that the plan review has been approved and another 79 that are in plan review. So we're still very busy there. The 72 that the plan review is approved are just waiting for the fees to be paid and then those permits can be issued. On the multifamily, uh, in the first four months, we have 181 units. It was 147 in March. Uh, these are the largest projects issued. Um, this is not different than it was last month. Um, so we don't have an issue to permit for a large project in April. These are the largest projects in plan review. Um, the new one on here is the Northeast Middle School, which is that highlighted in that red color there. The rest are the same from last month. And then the last slide is the largest projects in pre-development. Um, the new one this month is this one on mission uh, which is consolidating five lots into two and adding townhomes. And I was looking before the meeting, it looks like it's about 18 townhomes on there. And that's at 1608 East Mission. And that is all. Does anybody have questions for Chris? I just wanted to quickly, did you already send this PowerPoint to us? Not yet. Okay, can you send it to us? Yes, I will. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, with all of those presentations and those that went over, it is only 3.02, so we didn't do too bad. We'll see everybody back um, at 3.30. Thank you.